sources tell me you're dropping a new trade targets list on Daily Faceoff Live today. What can we expect from that, Frank? Well, that is a good scoop. Uh, the list is <laughs> being expanded from 25 to 30 names. That means if you're doing the math at home, there's five names. And so what you can expect is that Bo Horvat remains unshockingly in the number one spot. He's been there all season long. I believe trade talks are intensifying on that front. A number have t of teams have checked in with the Vancouver Canucks in recent days since Jim Rutherford's press conference on Monday in which he basically spelled out for everyone that Horvat is probably no longer going to be a member of the Vancouver Canucks. And so uh, those teams that are involved at this point, I believe, include but are not limited to the Boston Bruins, Minnesota Wild, Carolina Hurricanes, who could see a change now with the potential of Max Pacioretty uh, out for the season. We're still waiting on word for that. I think he's due to get an MRI today, but every indication to this point is that he may have retorn his Achilles, which is terrible news for him and tough news for the Canes. Um, so I mentioned Boston, Carolina, Minnesota, I think the Detroit Red Wings are also in that group, and I know I'm missing one. I just it's off the top of my head, but I'll, Seattle. It'll, it'll come to me. Oh, that's Seattle? it. The Seattle Kraken. Yep. How about the Leafs? Do you think they get involved on Horvat, or is it too rich of a price? I think it's too rich of a price, and I also don't know how much it really makes sense. Like, where would you slot him? How much does that eat into whatever John Tavares is doing? I guess you could move one of them to the wing, but if the Leafs are going to go down the forward path, I, to me, it's kind of the second line left wing spot that you'd probably be looking at. Someone that has some versatility that could play center if you really needed to and, and got into an injury issue. But I still think this team's focus is on the back end. And, and actually one of the names that I included on my list that I believe the Maple Leafs have inquired about is Jake McCabe. He was the biggest riser from uh, the last list that I did two weeks ago. He was in the number 20 slot all the way up to number seven. Uh, the Blackhawks have received a number of calls from him. He has a seven team no trade list. Uh, the other teams that have called include Edmonton and the Los Angeles Kings. Um, here's the thing with McCabe, his seven team, no trade list. You say, well, why seven teams? It probably includes all seven Canadian teams for the American born defenseman. But I'm told that the Maple Leafs are one team that are not part of that list. It's the other six Canadian teams. So interestingly enough, I think they've had some interest in him, uh, going back a ways and here's where it gets, this is what I outlined in the piece, Nick, here's where it really gets interesting from a Toronto perspective. What if you can entice the Chicago Blackhawks, who have tons of cap space, to retain half on Jake McCabe and get him at $2 million a year for each of the next two years? He's probably already playing at a $4 million level right now. Yes, there's risk and in injury history. There's risk with any player, but at $2 million a year, that gives you some serious cost certainty at a time when the Leafs really need it on their back end. Oh, without question, Frank, and certainly in this cap world, like you can, you, you need to grab that cap and that, that luxury any, anywhere you can find it. And certainly, I mean, you're an insider. Uh, how quiet has it been, uh, you know, behind the scenes? Because that's my biggest question. You know, I love NHL trades, but in this, in, in, in this cap era and the fact that every contender or a team who thinks they have a legit shot this, this year just has no cap space, right? I actually think it's heated up in a pretty big way this week. Um, this Horvat talk, I think has been a big generator of that. And I also think here's the other part of it. We're six weeks today from deadline day, pro scouting and amateur scouting meetings are wrapping up. Most teams have already done them. The Leafs were in the first week of January. They actually did them here in Philadelphia. Um, so they're, they have their marching orders. They have an idea of the names that are on their list, their positional needs and who they'd like to target. Now it's about going out and executing. And I, I think the Leafs have taken a really patient approach to this point, and that makes sense. Um, what you need today may not be what you need in six weeks, especially the way this season has gone with injuries. So I think that makes sense to take your time. Uh, I think they're surveying everything. and um, But I do think as a whole, um, the market has definitely, there's a lot of increased chatter in the last three to four days. I love to hear that as somebody, again, who loves trades. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, is Matthew Nyes an untouchable or could he end up being Toronto's like big deadline addition? 
Uh, not an untouchable. Um, I think someone that the Leafs clearly value, but I believe in the right deal is available. And I think you'd have to include just about anyone in terms of futures if you're the Leafs at this point. This is a burn the boats type year. Uh, they need to make hay in the playoffs. Uh, it's not just win one round with this team and how good they've been in the regular season the last few years. They need to do more than that. Um, and so I don't think you're leaving first round picks or uh, a prospect like Matthew Nyes, who I think there are question marks about. And and maybe if the Leafs could go back and have some revisionist history and, and redo last year's deadline, maybe they include him and, and take a bigger swing with, with some of the pieces that they, they did trade for. Um, because I think he's maybe viewed a little bit as less of a top prospect than he was one year ago. And so that's not a knock on the player. It's just that, look, guys take different paths of development. And who, I think they were a little bit uh, hesitant or had some trepidation to move him. And I think this time around uh, probably wouldn't be as big of a deal. Yeah, and I think to that point, too, we have to be careful in this market. It happened with Nick Robertson where the media hypes it up, hypes it up, and then the player gets to the league and there's just so much pressure to perform. And if I think you... You're crazy, I think, if you think a guy from college is going to come in and, and, and be a bona fide stud right away in your top six as you try to win a Stanley Cup. I just think it's unrealistic of an expectation. Um, Timo Meyer with the San Jose Sharks is always a name that's fascinated me. What, what can you tell us about Meyer? What's the likelihood he gets dealt? And could he be a possibility for the Maple Leafs? Uh, it's, it's a very high likelihood that he goes. Um, I don't think the Sharks are making much of a push to sign him. I think they got themselves into a lot of trouble last year when they went to the deadline. They didn't have a GM in place. Their acting GM, Joe Will, ended up signing Tomas Hurdle to that eight-year deal that I think is, you know, you haven't won with these guys. Why are you afraid to lose them? And that's, I think, the big concern now for the Sharks is how do we jumpstart our rebuild process? How do we begin to tear this down? And one of the easiest ways to maximize value is Timo Meyer. But here's the thing with Meyer is his contract is complicated because at the end of this season, he's due a $10 million qualifying offer. And we saw the blueprint of what that looks like from Alex DeBrinkett going from Chicago to Ottawa last year at the draft. It was on draft day itself. They got the number seven overall pick, the number 39, which was also a second round pick and uh, a, a third round pick as well. So a first, second and third. But here's the main difference. Uh, there's actually a couple that I believe illustrates why Timo Meyer, as good a player as he is, is going to bring back less than Debrinket. One is by the sheer nature of whatever team you're trading with in contender mode, that first round pick is going to be in the 20s, not seven overall. So you're already dealing back from that standpoint. And then two, with Debrinket, you at least had one more season of him at a relatively reasonable $6.4 million, whereas at the end of this, Meyer is an RFA and has some significant control and leverage. And he's also a few years older than Alex Debrinket. So I think all those things factored in, teams are going to point to that and say, hey, this might be a really reasonable acquisition cost provided that we can afford to sign this player long term it's going to depress the return for san jose but it's pretty good for any team that might be trying to get a guy who's going to hit 40 goals quite clearly for the first time in his career so horvat o'reilly tarasenko chikrin meyer some of the bigger names uh in your opinion i'll put you on the spot who moves first horvat uh, i think there's a real chance horvat is traded before the all-star break